I'll be reading 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. God. So much of the message for today. Take your candle, take your light into the darkness. The darkness hangs heavy upon us. Not only in America, but all over the world. And people are looking for light. And we have the light. For Jesus is the light of the world. And we go into the world reflecting that light that all might see. The darkest places might be made bright. The hopeless might find hope. That's who we are in Jesus Christ. That light which can break up the darkness. I want to read again something that they read earlier from the prophet Micah. And I want you to understand that Micah is the only prophet who was quoted by another prophet. A hundred years later, as Israel faced the oncoming Assyrian invasion, Jeremiah was preaching the people, and he quoted from the prophet Micah. That's how important Micah's words were, even then. But listen once again. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. People shall stream to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall all sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. This vision that Micah sets before the people is a vision of God's dream for humankind. The dream that he's had since before the foundation of the world, the dream that he knew he would need to have for we would get off the track pretty quickly didn't we and we stayed off the track all these years and so God knew that he was going to have to raise up a people a people who could be a light to the nations who could point people to the one true living God and so he raised up the nation of Israel. He gave them the direction about how to live their life, how to form themselves into a community, a different kind of community, an alternative community to all the communities on the earth. A community where all the needs of all the people would be met all the time. And there would be peace and love would reign supreme. This was God's dream for Israel. But we know what happened in Israel. 
Soon after she got into the promised land, Israel began to turn her attention not to God, not to the God who had rescued them from slavery, but to themselves. Not to God's will and God's way, but to their will and their way. There is a way which seems right unto mortals, but the end thereof is death and destruction. And so it was. In 722, the Syrians came and overran Israel. In 586, the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. So God knew there would be need for another people. And he sent Jesus into the world to give himself for the world, to lay before the world the kind of life that we need to lead to be the people God has called us to be and dreams that we might be, and then to die as the final affirmation that God's way is the way of sacrificial love. That alone can bring peace. And Jesus called around him a people that would become a holy nation. It's where we are in looking at the three titles that Peter gives us as Christians in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. A chosen race. Next week we'll talk about a royal priesthood, but today we're talking about a holy nation because this is the week we focus on nations. This is a title that had been given to Israel in Exodus 19 before the law was given. God said, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be to me a holy nation. Now Peter says, you in Jesus Christ have become God's holy nation. And his dream is to be realized in your lives and through your lives in the world. Notice that Micah said nothing about time after time. He said in the last times these things would happen because God's people would take seriously God's dream and seek to live into its reality as a holy Nation. Now let's think about that term. Nation, first of all. This is not a nation that's determined by lines drawn on a map. Not a nation that's determined by people who agree on a particular political ideology. Not a nation determined by people who live by a particular economic ideology. Not a nation determined by the color of a person's skin of the place of his birth, of the flag that flies overhead. No, this is a new kind of nation altogether that God is raising up from every nation, tribe, and tongue in the world. People will come from the east and the west, the north and the south, all to gather in this nation. And this nation exists wherever people pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God. Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin because they had been preaching about this and preaching about Jesus and they didn't like in Jerusalem. So Peter and John stood before the Sanhedrin and they ordered them to cease and desist from preaching and teaching about Jesus anymore anywhere, anytime, period. It was the law. The Sanhedrin had civil authority in Judea and Jerusalem. It was the law. And Peter said in response, 
We must obey God rather than any earthly authority. It was not a denial of the fact that there need to be earthly authorities or that we need to have allegiance to them. It was an announcement that for the Christian there is an authority above all earthly authorities. For the Christian has one sublime authority. And for the Christian, pledging allegiance to the kingdom is always prior to pledging allegiance to any earthly kingdom and determines the nature of our allegiance to any earthly kingdom. We must obey God rather than any earthly authority. And so they went out and preached. They broke the law. We call it civil disobedience today. This nation is a nation of people who may be living in any country who pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God. It's holy, this nation. We don't use the word holy very much in our culture anymore. We have holy smokes and holy cows. But in the biblical meaning of the word translated holy is set apart ones. And more than that, it's set apart for certain purposes. And more than that, it's set apart for the purposes of God. So we are a holy people because we have been set apart for God's purposes. Not our own, but God's purposes. Now, the problem is that God's purposes sometimes conflict with our purposes. Or with the purposes of our government. It's been true all through history. Christians have had to be true to the king of the kingdom no matter who was the ruler of the nation. And that brings conflict, doesn't it? And it's like you're trying to swim against the stream. And sometimes the stream is very strong, it's coming at you. But still we're called to swim against that stream if that's what it takes to be obedient to King Jesus. I like to go to baseball games in Kansas City where I lived in, with uh, my family when my kids were growing up. I like to go to baseball games. Kansas City has one of the best baseball stadiums in the world. It's just wonderful. You can see from every seat. I decided one day that I was going to take the boys to see a Royals game. And that on this day, I was going to buy them a Royals hat. Make it a really big day for them. So we got to the game and uh, went by one of the little concession areas. And they picked out the hat they wanted. And I paid for it. And up we went to our seats. We were way up there. In the nosebleed seats. Where you can hardly see the ball. You, you just see people running around and try to follow the game that way, but you can hardly see the ball. Well, we had a great time, but the boys were more interested in the hats than the game. They were kind of parading around, showing off their hats to all the people sitting around us. Well, it was just about time for the game to end. The Royals were ahead safely, and I thought, let's go ahead and leave so we can beat the crowd. Now, Royal Stadium has these huge circular ramps that go up to the nosebleed seats. They're about as wide as this center area of pews. And, and going to the game, there, there are people streaming up them, but coming out of the game, it's like a tidal wave. People want to get down those ramps as soon as they can 
So we started down the ramp. And about halfway down, Josh, my youngest, tugs on my coat and says, Daddy, Daddy, we've got to go back. I left my hat under the seat. Well, the tidal wave has already begun. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, we'll just stand over here to the side and wait until all these people get by. And then we'll go back. No, Daddy, we can't wait. Somebody will get my hat. So, what can you do? Brown puppy dog eyes looking up at you. I said, all right, boys. I want you to take my hand and don't let go no matter what happens. And we began to make our way back up that ramp against the flow. I heard language I'd never heard in my <laughs> life. But we finally made it, and the hat was still there. But it was difficult to get back to that hat. There was conflict all along the way. Sometimes doing what you know is right is going to bring conflict. Sometimes being obedient to the king is going to bring conflict. But this holy nation this holy nation. I'm not talking about any earthly nation here. I'm talking about the God's holy nation. And we must be very cautious and careful about equating God's holy nation with any earthly nation. God's holy nation is obedient regardless of the consequences. Martin Niemöller understood this. Have you heard of that name? Martin Niemöller was a pastor in Germany during the 20s and 30s and 40s when Hitler and National Socialism were taking the land by storm. At first he thought this might be good. After all, Hitler is bringing back jobs and we have almost full employment machinery of labor and industry is working beautifully. It seemed good. But gradually, Niemöller began to learn of other things that were happening. Other people who were being excluded, demeaned, mocked, scorned, and ultimately killed. Right there in Germany. People who were Germans. The German government required that all clergy pledge allegiance to Hitler as Fuhrer. Fuhrer means leader, but it almost means Lord. You've all seen People giving the Nazi salute, the Hitler salute, Heil Hitler. Martin Niemöller refused. One day, the showdown came on a Sunday. From the back of the sanctuary, a number of Gestapo agents in their black uniforms with skulls on the sleeve marched down the center aisle of the church, sat on the front pew of the church, and everyone knew why they were there. They were there to see if Niemöller was going to salute Hitler. Niemöller rose from his seat at the time of the sermon. He strode briskly into his pulpit, and he boomed out these words. Gott, mein Führer ist. God is my Führer. He was arrested. 
immediately. He was taken to a concentration camp. He spent seven years in that concentration camp. He knew what obedience means. But he was willing to pay the price of obedience. God wants there to be a holy nation of people scattered all around the world. People who will live for him his justice, his mercy, his righteousness in such a way that this vision that Micah has might begin to come to reality. Let's don't wait to some other time or some other place. Let's be God's holy nation in this place. At this time. Why be a holy nation? Well, Peter tells us. He puts it this way. In order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you from darkness into his marvelous light. <laughs> That's it. That we might proclaim in word and deed the marvelous deeds of that God who has called us out of darkness into light. That we might take our candles into the darkness and light the world for others to see. There is another way. There is a God who dreams that we will embrace the other way. Robert Louis Stevenson, the great Scottish author, tells a story about when he was a boy. He said he used to love to watch the lamplighter in his village light the big lamps on the streets, and he would go to the second floor of their house and watch him as he moved from pole to pole to pole to pole. And one night he got so excited he ran down to the kitchen, tugged on his mother's apron strings and said, Mommy, Mommy, come with me and see a man who is punching holes in the darkness. I like that. That's our call as God's holy nation. To punch holes in the darkness. So the light can shine and everyone, everywhere can sing. May God grant that it might so be Amen. with you and with me. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to pursue us with your relentless love and call us again and again to be that people who realize the dream and invite others to realize it too. So might we covenant together to be your holy nation to be obedient, come what may, that all the world in every corner might sing of your glory. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.